Will the House come to order and members kindly take their seats? Good afternoon. The devotional today will be led by Reverend Joan Javier Duval of the Unitarian Church of Montpelier. Good afternoon. On the side of our church building, there is a wooden rectangular box, roughly three feet high and three and a half feet wide. Inside the box, you can often find an inspirational quote of some kind. Currently, the quote is from the French writer and philosopher Voltaire and reads, everything in nature is resurrection. This box is called a wayside pulpit. The wayside pulpit at our church is updated about once or twice a month by one of our church members, Ted. Ted has been steadfastly carrying out this task, a ministry really, for the past several years. He is now 93 years old. Ted is so committed to this task that after we lost all of our printed quotations in this past summer's flood, over 100 printed sheets, Ted started to pay out of his own pocket to have quotations printed to replenish our stock. I was recently chatting with Ted and he told me a story I hadn't ever heard that gave me a glimpse into why he does what he does. He said that once he once read about someone who was in a pretty bad depressed state and was seriously contemplating taking their own life However, they remembered the quote they had seen in the wayside pulpit of their neighborhood church. It read, when you come to the end of your rope, tie a knot in it and hang on. As my church member told me, this person did decide to hang on. The message gave this person enough hope to live another day. As Ted was telling me this story, it dawned on me that this is the reason he is so committed to this small action. This is what gives him a sense of purpose, the possibility that he can make a difference, even for one person, is his why. As you go about your service on behalf of the people of Vermont today, I pray that you connect to your why. I pray that you call to mind and heart that one person for whom your actions decisions and leadership will make all the difference. And if at any point you're looking for inspiration, head down from the State House a couple blocks and take a peek at our wayside pulpit. Ted would be pleased. Thank you. Members, we have three Senate bills for referral today. The first is Senate Bill 181, which is an act relating to establishing a television assessment in community media uh, introduced by Senator Baruth. Please listen to the first reading of the bill. S-181, an act relating to establishing a television assessment in community media. Now the bill has been read the first time and is referred to the Committee on Environment and Energy. Next is Senate Bill 195, which is an act relating to how a defendant's criminal record is considered in imposing conditions of release. Introduced by Senator Calmore and others, please listen to the first reading of the bill. S-195, an act relating to how a defendant's criminal record is considered in imposing conditions of release. Now the bill has been read the first time and is referred to the Committee on Judiciary. And finally, Senate Bill 253 is an act relating to building energy codes introduced by Senator Bray. Please listen to the first reading of the bill. S-253, an act relating to building energy codes. Now the bill has been read the first time and is referred to the Committee on Environment and Energy. We now have a joint Senate resolution to take up at this time. JRS 51 is a joint resolution relating to weekend adjournment on April 5th. 2024. This resolution was offered by Senator Baruth and was read and adopted on the part of the Senate. Please listen to the reading of the resolution. 
resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives that when the two houses adjourn on Friday, April 5th, 2024, it be to meet again no later than Tuesday, April 9th, 2024. Now you've heard the reading of the resolution and the question is, shall the House adopt the resolution in concurrence? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it and the resolution is adopted in concurrence. Uh, members, we have received a, requ a request to read a House concurrent resolution that the House and the Senate adopted pursuant to the consent calendar. HCR 197 is a House concurrent resolution designating April 3rd, 2024 as Prevention Day in Vermont. Please listen to the reading of the resolution. Prevention, whereas Prevention Day is an annual event created to call attention to the issue of substance misuse prevention in Vermont. And whereas this observance is designed to bring together youth prevention organizations and supporters to educate public policy decision makers and to celebrate the substance misuse prevention community in Vermont. And whereas the General Assembly recognizes that the struggles that Vermonters continue to encounter with the misuse of alcohol, marijuana, tobacco, and other substances, as well as the economic, emotional, and psychological toll that this misuse takes on individuals, families, schools, workplaces, and communities. And whereas the network of community organizations, service providers, youth, and individuals dedicated to substance misuse prevention share a common goal of supporting healthy living for all Vermonters. And whereas celebrating Prevention Day is an opportunity for communities across the state to raise their voices in order to create a strong, sustainable, and unified system that promotes substance misuse prevention, healthy living, and wellness in Vermont. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives that the General Assembly designates April 3rd, 2024 as Prevention Day in Vermont. And be it further resolved that the Secretary of State be directed to send a copy of this resolution to Prevention Works Vermont. Are there any announcements? Member from Essex Junction. I rise to recognize community-based domestic and sexual violence advocates who join us in the House today. The 15 independent nonprofit member organizations of the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence provide support and services to thousands of Vermonters who experience domestic and sexual violence each year. Together, these nonprofit organizations serve every square mile of our state. In 2023, advocates at Vermont Network member organizations responded to 23,300 hotline and chatline calls from Vermonters experiencing domestic or sexual violence. They provided in-person assistance to 8,494 people by helping survivors access the justice system, medical services, and more. In addition to providing support to people who experience violence, these community-based advocates also engage in prevention work in communities throughout Vermont. Last year, through their collective efforts, over 16,000 Vermonters received prevention and education services. Not only do these advocates offer essential services to victims of crime in our state, they are available 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I hope the House will join me in welcoming advocates from across Vermont and thanking them for their work. Will the guest of the member from Essex Junction please rise and be recognized. <laughs> Are there any further announcements? Member from Clarendon. Madam Speaker, there's a member of the Health Care Committee um, who's having a special day today. Uh, this member uh, sits across from me in the committee, and and I can tell by the glaze sometime in his eyes that drinking water from a fire hose all day, for every day in the committee as he learns health care is a tough, tough thing. But this, uh, this guy uh, is a great guy and a great legislator, and I'd like to wish the member from Enosburg a happy birthday. Happy birthday, member.
Gotcha. <laughs> Member from Westford. Madam Speaker, um, I feel like our long nights on the floor last week led to a less than stellar performance for the cash mob. Understandably so. I felt like I fell, fell down on the job a little bit last week also. But we have another bite at the apple this week, and I just want to encourage everyone to get their $25 out uh, and try Capital Fa for lunch, Julio's for dinner, or Langdon Street Tavern if for a well-deserved cocktail. And I also had another recommendation. If you don't um, have the opportunity to spend your full $25, maybe it's, you could consider a generous tip for the people that work in these establishments. Thank you. Are there any further announcements? Seeing none, orders of the day. Members, we're gonna begin with House Bill 862, which is an act relating to approval of amendments to the charter of Barry, of the town of Barry. Please listen to the third reading of the bill. H 862, an act relating to approval of amendments to the charter of the town of Barry. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it and you have passed the bill. Up next is House Bill 874, which is an act relating to miscellaneous changes in education laws. Prior to the third reading, the member from Jericho, Representative Granning, offers an amendment to the bill that is printed in today's calendar. Um, members, I do not see the member from Jericho here, so we're gonna take a brief recess um, to find them. The House will stand at recess until the fall of the gavel, which is hopefully one minute. Will the House come to order and members kindly take their seats? Member from Jericho. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, so my amendment looks at what we amended in the bill yesterday. Um, and I had it all pulled up. And it was in the, my apologies. In this, so yesterday's calendar at the bottom of page 3010, we talked about the sixth, the sixth instance of amendment in section 10, and we're looking at post-graduation and career settlement behaviors of students attending Vermont post-secondary institutions and are in a report. And the easiest way to think about uh, my amendment is the second instance of amendment goes into section no, section one right after that, and removes the significant demographic groups, including assessment by demographic group of over or underrepresented, underrepresented in these programs, and moves that up so that it covers all of those instances of one through five and not only section one of that amendment. And so this, um, I presented this to the um, education committee earlier today, and they found um, this amendment favorable. Member from Williston. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We appreciate the amendment and on a vote, a straw poll of 1200, found it favorable and ask for the body's support. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Jericho? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have amended the bill. Please listen to the third reading of the bill. H 
H-874, an act relating to miscellaneous changes in education laws. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have passed the bill. Members, uh, it's my understanding the Committee on um, Corrections and Institutions is just wrapping up listening to some amendments. So we will skip over H 876 and 882 and just continue down um, the calendar. So with that, House Bill 884 is an act relating to the modernization of governance for the St. Albans Cemetery Association. Please listen to the third reading of the bill. H884, an act relating to the modernization of governance for the St. Albans Cemetery Association. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? Member from Halifax. Madam Speaker, I just want to thank the member from St. Albans City for the uh, punny bill report. It really won me over. Um, but I want to caution the member to, on this topic, never challenge death to a pillow fight. You don't want to fa face the reaper cushions. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have passed the bill. Up next is Senate Bill 278, which is an act relating to prohibiting a comparative negligence defense in an action for a negligence claim relating to a sexual act or sexual conduct. Please listen to the third reading of the bill. S-278, an act relating to prohibiting a comparative negligence defense in an action for a negligence claim relating to a sexual act or sexual conduct. The question is, shall the bill pass in concurrence with proposal of amendment? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have passed the bill in concurrence with proposal of amendment. Next is Senate Bill 190, which is an act relating to statements made by a child victim of an offense involving serious bodily injury. The bill was referred to the Committee on Judiciary, which recommends that the bill ought to pass in concurrence. The member from Williston, Representative Arsenault, will speak for the committee. Please listen to the second reading of the bill. S190, an act relating to statements made by a child victim of an offense involving serious bodily injury. Member from Williston. Thank you, Madam Speaker. S-190 can be found on the legislative website. The purpose of S-190 is to limit the number of times a child must recount their experience of physical abuse that resulted in serious bodily injury. A number of witnesses we heard from testified to the detrimental impacts on a child who must repeatedly tell the story of their abuse. One witness who works as a child abuse pediatrician asserted that these experiences would in fact likely cause further harm to child victims. We also heard in testimony that offenses against children resulting in serious bodily injury, particularly strangulation of a child, are on the rise making this change all the more necessary. Without these changes, cases involving serious bodily injury will continue to be under prosecuted simply because child victims or their caregivers cannot face the prospect of re-traumatization through deposition or trial. Most of this bill amends court rules, not statute, which the General Assembly has clear authority to do under 12 VSA Section 1, and is a fine example of relatively small changes that can have an enormous impact on some of our youngest Vermonters. Section 1 amends Vermont, Vermont Rules of Criminal Procedure with respect to depositions. 
a deposition involves the taking of sworn out of court oral testimony of a witness that may be reduced to a written transcript for later use in court or for discovery purposes. Discovery means investigating the evidence that the other side plans to present. Currently, there are special rules regarding depositions of children under 16 years of age if they are victims of certain sexual offenses. S-190 extends those protections to children under 16 years of age if they are victims in a case of cruelty to a child involving serious bodily injury. Depositions in such cases are only to be taken upon agreement of the parties or upon approval of the court under the following three conditions. First, the court finds that the testimony of the child is necessary to assist the trial. Second, the evidence sought is not reasonably available by any other means. And third, that the probative value of the testimony outweighs the potential detriment to the child being deposed. If a deposition is taken, the court must appoint an attorney for the child and issue a protective order to protect the child from emotional harm, unnecessary annoyance, embarrassment, oppression, invasion of privacy, or undue burden of expense or waste of time. Section two of the bill amends the Vermont rules of evidence with respect to the admissibility of hearsay. Hearsay is an out of court statement offered as evidence to prove the truth of whatever it asserts. Think of hearsay as secondhand evidence. Because the person being quoted is not present, it makes determining the credibility of that statement difficult. Thus, hearsay evidence is usually not admissible. However, court rules provide circumstances where hearsay evidence can be entered into evidence. Rule 804A of the Vermont Rules of Evidence, which is being amended in Section 2 of the bill, currently permits hearsay statements by a child 12 years of age or under if the child is the presumed victim of a sexual offense. S-190 extends that admissibility to hearsay statements by a child 12 years of age or under if the child is the presumed victim of cruelty to a child involving serious bodily injury. To assure credibility, first the statements must not have been made in preparation for a legal proceeding and if a criminal or delinquency proceeding has been initiated, the statements must have been made prior to the defendant's initial appearance before a judicial officer. Second, the child must be available to testify in court, for instance, at the request of defense counsel. And third, the time, content, and circumstances of the statements must provide substantial indicia of trustworthiness. Section 2A contains a change that codifies existing practice into law by providing that interviews of children conducted by the special investigative units must be recorded. Finally, this act takes effect on July 1st, 2024. We heard from Legislative Council, a UVM Child Protection Specialist, who is also co-chair of the Vermont Citizens Advisory Board, the Deputy Defender general and chief juvenile defender from the defender general's office victims advocate from the windsor county state's attorney's office the executive director of the center for crime victim services the executive director of the windham county special investigations unit and child advocacy center deputy state's attorney from franklin county victim advocate from franklin county state's attorney's office and the northwest unit for special investigations and the chief superior judge from the vermont judiciary Again, these rule changes will help protect young victims of physical abuse from having to revisit that trauma over and over again in intimidating environments. Providing that protection also has the potential benefit of increasing the number of abuse cases that are actually prosecuted. Our committee vote was 11 0 on the bill as passed by the Senate, and we ask for your support. The question is, shall, shall the bill be read a third time? Member from Putney. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I rise in support of this bill, uh, and I do so in my capacity working in child protection and now as a, a guardian ad litem in the child protection system. 
uh, all too often um, substantiated perpetrators um, walk away from being held accountable uh, because on appeal, the parents don't want the child to be subjected again to the trauma of having to testify about their abuse. So they withhold the child from testifying again. I applaud this, this uh, statute, this, this change uh, that will hold people accountable and do a better job of protecting our children. The question is, shall the bill be read a third time? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and third reading is ordered. Members, we are going to now take up House Bill 876, and then following that, H882. Up next is House Bill 876, which is an act relating to miscellaneous amendments to the correction laws. Prior to third reading, the member from Burlington, Representative China, offers an amendment to the bill that is printed in today's calendar. Member from Burlington. I've been, uh, Madam Speaker, I've been talking about this for like four hours straight, so I was just catching my breath there in the corner, and I just need a, like a second to like pull up, pull up this, the language, so. So the, the amendment to H-876 is um, offered in two instances. And Madam Speaker, I'm gonna request that the question be divided and the committee um, did vote on the instances separately. So you will hear from the committee their report on this amendment um, shortly. So in the first instance of amendment to miscellaneous amendments to the correction laws, what this amendment does is adds into a report that we are requiring from the, um, or a review that we are requiring from the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee. We're, what this amendment does is it adds into to that review, um, a review of a potential earned allowance program and a potential pilot project in expanding um, outpatient mental health and substance use disorder treatment services to people who are in incarcerated. So, um, and so I'll say more about the details of this in a second, but essentially what it does is it asks the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee to look at earned allowances and continuity of care when they look at earn expanding earn time. So, um, Another thing that the amendment does is it requires that the Joint Justice, that I struggle with the name of this one, Joint Legislative Justice Oversight, um, or as the committee calls it, Justice Oversight. So maybe I'll use that shorthand moving forward. It, 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 it asks that Justice Oversight, it requires that Justice Oversight take testimony from justice-involved individuals with lived experience in a correctional facility as well as others who've worked with such individuals. Um, and I added that in because we have seen a lack of testimony and a lack of involvement of the voices of justice involved individuals um, in our policy making around corrections and in all other policy areas. We have seen an expansion of the incorporation of the voices of people with lived experience. And so that's why I have that in the amendment. And then it leaves other aspects of the bill, of, of the bill alone in B and C, but in D, it adds in creating an earned allowance program for all sentenced and incarcerated individuals, including those on furlough. Oh, I'm reading from the amendment. I hope that's okay. Okay, so um, including those on furlough, probation, and parole that permits such individuals to accrue monetary allowances to use towards the costs associated with victim restitution 
educational advancement, healthcare, housing, occupation, taxes, and any fines. And so I read you the exact language because I think it would be simpler than saying that any other way. That we would be creating, we were asking this, the, we are asking justice oversight in their review of earned time to also look at earned allowance, a way to provide an economic incentive for participation in programming, and that that allowance be designated um, to be used to the costs of the items I just read, paying back victims, improving themselves and the lives of themselves and their family, and paying back the state if they owe the state money. So right now we do not have a way that uh, in our current system for incarcerated individuals to have economic opportunity like this. Um, and so that would be added um, so that when, when, when the review is looking at giving earned time for educational credits, that it would also be looking at an earned allowance so that we're giving people breaks on their sentences and a chance to earn money as incentives for participation. Um, then in the second part, it asks that joint, um, that justice oversight um, review and determine the feasibility of implementing a pilot project for providing community-based mental health and substance use disorder services to detained or incarcerated individuals, individuals re-entering the community. So this whole section, a uh, subdivision, I believe it's called B, is new. Um, and so it would require that um, the committee re review include testimony from those with lived experience, um, looking at how the service would be, re be reimbursed um, both within the correctional facility and, and outside, like looking at the continuity, because currently if a person's on Medicaid and they become incarcerated, or actually if a person's on any insurance, they become incarcerated, they lose their coverage, they go into the facility, our healthcare contractor is supposed to take care of them, the committee can tell you more about that, but our healthcare committee heard testimony and people are not getting taken care of. We are not, meet, we are not providing care that, that meets the prevailing standard by any means. In fact, I would argue that it's almost torture what's happening to some people in our facilities. All this would do is ask um, that we look at how do we make sure people are continuing to get their care? How is it like being delivered outside and inside? How is it being coordinated between settings to make sure that care continues? And how are we making sure the providers are paid in and out? And so it doesn't necessarily bind us to any plan. It's asking joint oversight to consider these factors and weigh in and come back with a report, including data. How would we track you know, success of such a program? Um, so that's what this section does. So ultimately, the first instance, in summary, the first instance of amendment would, at, would um, have ju justice oversight look at two additional things in when they're reviewing earned time they would also look at earned allowance and they would look at the continuity of care um now madam speaker this is i think a point of order or inquiry inquiry would we want to have the vote on the first instance and then i present the second one we can do that madam. okay let's do that maybe so that it's just we can keep things moving like all right Member from Springfield. Madam Speaker, your Committee on Corrections and Institutions spent time this morning and a little bit this afternoon with a member from Burlington on his amendment. Uh, we have agreed to separate this amendment. <clears throat> the first instance of amendment is the one I will be dealing with. Uh, the second amendment, the second instance of amendment, the member from Montpelier will be responding. Our committee <clears throat> spent quite a bit of time looking at this and we have some real concerns on this amendment. The Justice Oversight Committee is an oversight committee. It does not get into a deep dive as our standing committees do. It is a high level, it oversees uh, policies of the Department of Corrections. And the committee only meets about six times during the off session. They'll meet a few times during the summer and a few times in the fall, and they only give recommendations. This particular amendment has um, some issues that really need legislative standing commi committee work 
done on it in terms of earned allowances. Um, also, in terms of establishing and looking at a pilot project and the assessments for that is way beyond the uh, purview of the Justice Oversight Committee. So with that, Madam Speaker, your Committee on Corrections and Institutions took a vote and the motion was that we find this amendment unfavorable on a vote of 803. And we request that you vote no on this amendment. So the question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Burlington in the first instance of amendment in section four? Member from Burlington. So Madam Speaker, I wanna thank the committee once again for engaging in, in discussion about um, this issue of important public concern of, of incarceration and, it, and its impact on the people of Vermont. And um, it sounds like they don't, that the, the limitations of the, ju the Justice Oversight Committee that in terms of time and resources over the off session uh, may not be the best place to, for this work to be done. Um, I did introduce two bills this session that didn't get any testimony beyond the introduction, I think. So my hope is um, if the body finds these issues to be pressing that, it, that there may be other ways we can work on this this session. And if not, perhaps some people would uh, be willing to work together in the future to provide greater economic, economic opportunity incentives to our incarcerated individuals. And, um, and even more importantly, fulfill our current law and make sure that medical care in our facilities are meeting the prevailing standards. Thank you. So the question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Burlington in the first instance of amendment? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. nay. The nays appear to have it. The nays do have it. And you have declined to amend the bill. Now the question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Burlington in the second instance of amendment in section seven? Member from Burlington. All right, Madam Speaker, this one should be quicker. So um, I am gonna, hold on, I have to rewind. So Madam Speaker, may I refer to the underlying bill because the context is gonna be important. Like I'm not gonna quote okay. it, but okay. So I have to just, I have so many tabs open. So here we go. So in the underlying bill, it's, it's miscellaneous amendments to the correction laws. There's a variety of things. So if you, um, if you look to section seven of the bill, and I'll tell people the page, I find this helps people. So let's see, it's section seven is, there's a report that begins on page 17 in line nine. It's a report that's gonna be issued that the Department of Corrections is gonna is create with, in consultation with the Office of the State Auditor, the Judiciary, the Department of Buildings and General Services, the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, the Office of the Defender General, and the Law Enforcement Advisory Board. And this written report is, is gonna be in the form of an actionable plan detailing the feasibility of necessary steps and preparations required to transition away from contracting with privately operated for-profit or out-of-state correctional facilities. What the amendment does, there are, the report has multiple items that it must include, it shall include. In the fourth item that it shall include, this amendment adds a phrase. So it adds in the phrase, this is the moment when you wish you had like the thing from ledge council with the highlighted part, you know, so that every, everyone here knows about. Um, so hold on, because I, I have to put them side by side to tell you this exactly. Okay. It basically adds in the phrase, 
and to employ the use of alternatives to incarceration. So in an existing, in the, where that fits in the existing language is the existing language says plans to enhance the capabilities of Vermont-based correctional facilities in anticipation, and it adds in between there, and to employ the use of alternatives to incarceration. So now it would say plans to enhance the capabilities of Vermont-based correctional facilities and to employ the use of alternatives to incarceration in anticipation of any changes to Vermont's incarcerative population resulting from the termination of contracts with privately operated for-profit or out-of-state correctional facilities. So essentially, in the report that we are, are requiring to be produced by the Department of Corrections, we are, this amendment asks them to look at alternatives to incarceration. And I've spoken a lot about what these are, um, there was an ex I was asked to give an example, at least one, so I'm going to give, briefly give you one, but I am happy to share the details if people want to go deeper. That in New York City, they are closing Rikers Island. And with the replacement are borough-based facilities that are embedded into the communities. And I, I'm going to talk a little bit, a bit more about the design of them in another amendment, so I'm not going to get into it now. But the idea is that um, there are different ways of running our facilities, and also some other alternatives to incarceration would be transitional housing in the neighborhoods nearby, supportive housing in the neighborhoods around, community-based services that, that work with people in a facility and follow them back into the other forms of housing or into their homes. And so the idea is that there are examples, there are many examples of alternatives to incarceration and that all we're doing here is asking that DOC come back with some information about how they could be incorporated into our plan on how to bring people home from out-of-state facilities. Thank you. Member from Montpelier. Madam Speaker, your Committee on Corrections and Institutions always appreciates hearing from the member from Burlington. He's almost our 12th committee member at this point. Um, we uh, did listen to the uh, proposed amendment, which on first blush would uh, be very similar to section 7B2, uh, uh, which asked the committee to report back on strategies to transition Vermont inmates currently housed at private operated for-profit or out-of-state correctional facilities to Vermont-based correctional facilities or alternative rehabilitation programs. Uh, what the member does in his amendment is it, it's related, but broadens it slightly to employ the use of alternatives to incarceration, period. Um, and we thought with this broad group of stakeholders uh, submitting the report, it would be well within their scope and they would be the right people at the table uh, to be looking at these alternatives to incarceration, uh, if necessary or appropriate. So uh, your committee uh, did find the amendment favorable on a vote of 803, and we would ask for your support. So the question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Burlington in the second instance of amendment? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it and you have amended the bill. Please listen to the third reading of the bill. H-876, an act relating to miscellaneous amendments to the corrections laws. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have passed the bill. And finally, we'll turn to House Bill 882, which is an act relating to capital construction and state bonding budget adjustment. Prior to third reading, the member from Burlington, Representative China, offers an amendment that is printed in today's calendar. Member from Burlington. Madam Speaker, um, I said this in two committees today, so 
my apologies to the committee members for hearing it again, but I think it, it's Im so important that the b whole body needs to hear it too. So you could, you could play a game on your phone or something for a minute, um, or check your email, or, or listen again. But if, if, if any of us, I think, were on a train, and the train was moving along fast, and all the passengers were you know, on board, doing the things passengers do, just trusting the process, trusting that the train is heading to the destination they wanted to go. But then like, let's say you like, you went up on the roof to vape or something and like, and like you looked ahead and down, you know, far ahead, you see that the bridge is gone and that the train is heading towards off a ravine. I think almost any single one of us would run into the train yelling, stop the train, and, and try to get the conductor to stop and figure out another way to get across that ravine. And that, that is how I feel about the path that we are on with this new wave of building carceral facilities. In, in the 80s, there was a wave of mass in, incarceration in, in, the, in the country. And institutionalization and many facilities and prisons were built and we're at a turning point where we're starting to see things change around the world and in, in a new way emerging and continuing down the path of building a correctional facility would not only be could not only potentially be a, a waste of money but it could be socially disastrous at this time when we need to be healing the social fabric instead of perpetuating more harm and suffering in the world. And so I am offering this amendment knowing that I can't stop the train and it may not stop today, but I offer it also knowing that when we offer amendments and they lose, that it, it contributes to the discussion, it contributes to the traje trajectory of an issue, and that the presentation that I will try to keep brief after this introduction in the sake of, you know, saving energy and being efficient and merciful, that, um, that every time that people think about this issue and think about a new way, that that is planting a seed in our minds, it's planting a seed in the mind of the collect collective consciousness, and that someday the more energy that we give and the more words we speak about this new way, that we will bring it into being. And so on, in the spirit of that, here we go. So what the amendment does is it, I'm not gonna review it in order, Madam Speaker, because it can be confusing. I'm gonna summarize it and try to make, make it quicker. Because I think when you go through it line by line, and it, I think for some people who don't understand, it gets confusing. So what it's saying is we are, re I actually have a five bullet points that I wrote, if I may read them, I think that'll make it easiest. Okay. So it places a five year moratorium on new correctional facilities and on expansion of existing correctional facilities it, it, it says we are not going to build any new prisons or expand any prisons for five years. We're gonna stop the train and think about a different way to get across that chasm. It reinvests the funds that we've already designated in our capital budget from last year, because this is a budget adjustment. It reinvests money and says this money that's been designated for a replacement woman's facility is now gonna be used to improve existing facilities. It's not gonna build anything new. It's gonna do in upgrades, maintenance, improvements, and it's gonna preserve the language we passed last year that create wellness environments for supporting trauma-informed practices at existing correctional facilities. Third thing that it does, is it repeals all of the language around planning and site, finding sites for the women's correctional and reentry facilities. Because there is language in last year's bill saying we're gonna build a women's correctional facility. It doesn't say we're gonna build a women's residential recovery facility. It doesn't say we're gonna build a women's group home. It says correctional facility. 
It repeals that language. It also removes the study that's in the capital budget adjustment before us today about reusing the existing women's correctional facility as a new men's reentry facility. And it adds a study in its place on all state properties that could be utilized to provide transitional housing, secure residential recovery facilities, therapeutic community residences, and other residential treatment facilities for justice-involved individuals. So essentially what, what I'm asking for in this amendment is that we stop the train and we think of at this moment in history how we could do things differently that it, it, you know, I've been in this body through more than one disaster at this point. And when the pandemic hit, it changed the way we thought about the world. And it made us like kind of rethink how we were living. And as much as people wanted to go back to the old way, we knew we couldn't. But I still feel like people really want to go back to how things were, but how things were wasn't working. And then the flooding hit. And we've learned this lesson before with Irene, and we really did evolve with Irene about how we structure our, we plan our infrastructure. So here we are now picking up the pieces from a pandemic and a recovery, about to launch a statewide regional planning around land use. Why not coordinate that with this study? Why not look at how can we use state land at the core of community, like of these new neighborhoods, similar to what they're doing in New York City. So in New York City, closing Rikers Island, closing a, a prison literally on an island, isolating people away from everyone in horrid, torturous conditions. Now they are building a prison in the heart of each borough. They're putting the prison in Manhattan in the heart of downtown. And if you, if you read through the details of the design, thinking about how the streetscape merges into the building, how the public can be brought into the structure. And that's, that's a whole different conception about how to handle people who've caused harm. Instead of throwing them away, we say to them, we're going to wrap you in love. We're going to wrap you in the center of our community and surround you with resources and believe that you can get better. And then we're going to take you back. And that's that, 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 embedding an infrastructure of, of, uh, of sort of, a, of, a, of our values, is, it would be tremendously healing at this moment in history when we're trying to heal our relationship with the earth and, fix, and mend the social fabric. And so I share that with you, uh, you know, in the spirit of dreaming of a better world and of hope. Um, I know that it's, it may be unrealistic, but... The only way you know, we're ever going to get over that chasm it, it is going to be by dreaming of a better way at this point. And there's examples out there to look to. And if only we had a little more time, um, because I think spending money on any more planning for a facility that may be obsolete in 10 years is a waste of, of taxpayer money. It's a waste of spending. It's a waste of energy. And I think the lack of the voice of those most impacted so far is part of the problem. And so it's my hope that we can slow down, bring in those voices, and then engage communities. We have the prime opportunity here with the public engagement that our regional planning commissions are gonna be doing, that the state could coordinate with that and engage communities in dreaming of a better world for everyone in which, it, and it, as part of that planning, we include what we do with people who have broken the law or harmed others and how we can turn, you know, the Department of Corrections into a Department of Recovery, you know? So on that note, I'll stop there. Um, thank you for hearing me out. And, you know, it's my hope that we can continue these discussions in committees and in the community. Thank you. Member from Burlington. Madam Speaker, your Committee for Corrections and Institutions thanks the member from Burlington for also bringing this amendment for our consideration. Uh, we heard the member's presentation at 8.30 this morning and are grateful for the opportunity to have considered the alternatives presented within. Um, the committee agreed that there are many valid components of the member's vision for alternatives to, correct to corrections, uh, but we do not feel them to be practical for continued consideration within H882 at this time, given the testimony we've received pertaining to current political will and societal will. 
At this point, your Committee for Corrections and Institutions remains convinced that proceeding with the process by which the Department of Building and General Services is tasked with identifying land suitable for the siting of a replacement to the current uh, Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility is the right step. And we are thankful for the members' continued commitment to the ongoing conversation. That being said, we found this amendment to be unfavorable on a vote of 803. And now for the Committee on Appropriations, member from Chittenden. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, the Appropriations Committee uh, as well appreciates the member from Burlington and his presentation on the amendment and reasons therefore. Um, however, many of the issues raised relate to policy considerations um, that we felt were the purview of the House Institution and Corrections Committee. And on a vote of 10-0-2, the committee found this amendment unfavorable. So the question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Burlington? Are you ready for the question, member from Burlington? Um, Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank the committee once again for making the time to talk. And I, I, this is kind of what I expected because I know that it's hard to change course. Um, someone did say to me recently, how come you didn't start working on this sooner? I just, for the record, want everyone to know it's been eight years that I have been visiting this committee and that the committee has changed policy over time in, in, in great ways. And so I, I appreciate that. And I do believe that that's part of how this process works. It's slow. Um, and, and that the only way we change it is by endlessly and tirelessly, you know, advocating and engaging with each other. Um, the last thing I'll say about this issue is that the, when, when uh, it has to do with, um, you know, this is the Corrections and Institutions Committee, it has to do with institutions that when we, when our society or country decided to embrace deinstitutionalization, the state went from having asylums filled with thousands of people and group homes filled, you know, hundreds of people around the state, slowly transitioning back into the community. We never built the institutions or the community care to help them. And now we see hundreds of people sleeping in the woods, hundreds of people, um, you know, people in hotels. We see people struggling to maintain their housing. We see a housing crisis. I don't think the answer is reinstitutionalization. It's a new way. And, you know, hopefully we can continue discussions about how do we fulfill the, the promise of deinstitutionalization and truly build community care in Vermont um, in the rest of this biennium and in years to come. So thank you. The question is Shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Burlington? Member from Burlington. Uh, Madam Speaker, I voted to find this amendment unfavorably. And I'm gonna do so here in a moment as well. Um, and I just wanna talk a little bit about how difficult that is for me, um, but how committed I am to that decision um, and the evolution I've had to arrive to that decision point. I suspect that there are members in the body that share, um, I didn't prepare anything, so bear with me, that share my um, deliberation on whether or not a moratorium might be a good idea and whether or not we can become a society that, in which prisons are obsolete, to paraphrase Angela Davis, because I think we can get there. Um, this was a difficult decision for me uh, for a few reasons. First and foremost, as you may be picking up, it puts me at odds with my district mate, and that is hard for me uh, because his commitment um, to this issue is, I, I just have a lot of respect for him um, and have had for some time. And as he mentions, he has been involved in this work for a very long time. Um, so that's difficult for me. Uh, it's gonna be difficult for me to articulate this position to many members in my district um, I'm prepared to do that, and I, I feel good, as I've said, about my decision. Um, in this instance, um, it's difficult nonetheless. Uh, I have a lot of practice, um, both in my job uh, when I'm not here and um, in my family of origin of being the disappointment. 
And I talk to students. I'll, I, I can. I'll, I'm, I'm free. I, let's talk about that offline. But um, <laughs> I talk to students often, especially politically active students, about how easy it is to become disappointed and how difficult it is to be the disappointment. But as I said, I've, I've had some practice, given the discussions and the decisions I have to make on a daily basis in my job. So I'll be fine. Um, the, 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 another significant reason why this is a difficult decision for me has to do with kind of who I identify as a person um, and the values I hold to idealism. Um, and these started for me when I was a graduate student. I don't know if they started, but um, I, when I was a graduate student, a lot of my writing and research was on political activism on college campuses. And in doing that, I read a book that has stayed with me. I, I still have it. It's on my bookshelf. Um, don't tell my professor, because he gave it to me. Um, it's called When Dreams and Heroes Died, and it's by a researcher named Arthur Levine. Bear with me. I'm, I'm just providing a little context. In that book, he, he identifies the cycles with which our society ebbs and flows through what he calls community ascendancy and individual ascendancy. Um, at the time of the writing in the 80s, so it's, a lot, it's an old book, um, community ascendancy kind of can be described as, as that period of time through the 60s where we were incredibly active as a society and outwardly motivated. Um, ebbs and flows into individual ascendancy, for those of you who remember the 80s, kind of the hedonism, the meism versus the weism of the 60s. As I was doing this writing, I was, I was very politically active as an undergraduate student, and I was wondering kind of where that energy was moving, and I found this book, and I was writing in the 90s on this topic. Um, and I wanted to know if he had updated, there's about 20 year cycles, if he had updated for the 90s, I wanted to know what to anticipate with the college students that I had anticipated working with very shortly. Um, my professor encouraged me to reach out to him. This is before, really, email was really young at this point. So um, I think I called him. He agreed to meet with me. And I said, where are we going, right? This would have been kind of at the dip, the trail end of the um, individual ascendancy of the 80s. And I was really anticipating moving back into a um, a collective community ascendancy of the 90s. And what he said to me, this is what stuck with me, and this is kind of at the heart of my um, frustrations, um, my personal frustrations with doing this work in this, in this room. Um, so he said, I got really angry. So he said, um, yeah, I've, I've been interviewing students. I'm, I'm, I'm planning to do at least an, an article, if not an, another book. Um, and he said, what I'm finding uh, is that the students of today, of the 90s, are pragmatically idealistic. I was like, well, that's a sellout, right? I, I, I got mad, I got angry. I, I was like, well, where are the idealists, right? Um, I was talking with a, a, a colleague just today, a member from, a, from our committee, and I told him how surprised I am to be finding myself a pragmatist in this matter. It's new territory for me. Um, and I do wonder, and I've been wondering this for the past year and a half. I worry, I guess. Point of order, Madam Speaker. Member uh, from Clarendon, what is your point of order? Uh, are we talking about the amendment here? Uh, uh, to me, we're off base. Um, member, I find your point of order uh, not well taken. The member has um, a right to give their um, feedback on how they are voting on the amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll cut to the chase. I worry um, that I acquiesce too soon to the pragmatism, um, that I don't dig in hard enough on, on what could be, on my hopes for, for the future. Um, that being said, I do I've given a lot of thought to the political will that I'm seeing around this issue. Um, and I worry that if we don't continue the process by which we are going to design an alternative facility, um, that the women who are incarcerated in Vermont are going to persist 
in an environment where our entire committee can agree is absolutely horrendous. That's what I worry about. Um, I worry that there's not the will to engage with the member from Burlington's vision of hope um, and change. Um, and I worry that we're gonna stall. Um, it's hard enough to find land to, buy, to, 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 to build one institution. Um, so that's why I'm proceeding with my vote to find this amendment unfavorable and to proceed with the process by which we are going to site and then design and then build uh, a replacement facility for the correctional facility. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Burlington, member from Halifax? Madam Speaker, um, this has been the topic of a possible moratorium and, and uh, prohibition on out-of-state contracts. Several related issues have been uh, spent taking hours of our committee time this biennium. Um, it's been one of the hardest things uh, to at times go against um, the member from Burlington on this in um, wanting to give the state as many options as it can uh, over the course of the next 10 years to meet our shared values. Um, and one of the pieces that has given me actually hope and, and encouragement on our ability to move forward with vision on corrections without a hard moratorium, which I think is sort of slamming the state against a stone wall eventually. You know, as the representative from Springfield said about our Capitol bill, our buildings are our policy. Um, and that means that the architecture, architecture is policy making and architects are set, themselves are policy makers. Um, and Madam Speaker, in my uh, work outside of this building, I uh, have worked a lot with architects. I'm not one, but I admire them tremendously. Um, and I'm proud to serve them in my work, particularly because the architecture of today is not like the architecture 50 years ago that built these buildings. Um, no one wants to build more of those buildings of 50 years ago. And what has changed not only about our architecture, because not only the architecture, but the process itself, which firms like the ones engaged by the state and BGS itself are using an integrative process. So we're not just relying on individuals with lived experience in an incarcerative system coming into our committee to give us input, which is important to us. And I want to state clearly we have done um, and do in different ways. But we are also seeing that incarcerated individuals and affected populations are going to be brought in on the very design process of the buildings um, in this bill. And that is very heartening to me. I believe in the process of design that when you bring voices to the table, you find solutions that can meet more needs than you even imagined. And I'm very encouraged by the bill. And as much as I appreciate the representative from Burlington's engagement with the committee and his, his amendment, I did vote no on this. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Burlington? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. <coughs> the nays appear to have it. The nays do have it, and you have declined to amend the bill. Please listen to the third reading of the bill. H882, an act relating to capital construction and state bonding budget adjustment. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? It, member from Burlington. Madam Speaker, although this bill has so many great investments in the state in it, at this point, I can no longer in good conscience vote yes on, on an action that is perpetuating the level of suffering and harm and trauma that our correctional system does. And this, that I, I've been part of the stakeholders group planning, uh, hearing about the new woman's facility. And the one time two incarcerated women were brought there, when they heard about the alternatives, 
they lit up and talked about how that's what they need. And one by one, the stakeholders said to Corrections, can we do something different? And Corrections has said no, the legislature is ordering us to move forward with this. So what that has shown me is that the only way this is gonna stop is if we stop it. So I have to vote no, it, and I respect all the hard work of the, of the committee, but I can't be complicit in, in the violence of the state that it's gonna be committed by the passage of this capital budget adjustment. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have passed the bill. Members, that completes the orders of the day. Are there any announcements? Member from Guilford. Madam Speaker, um, uh, it came, has come to my attention that the member from Heinsberg had a birthday yesterday, and we, I would like the body to join me in wishing him a happy birthday. Happy birthday, member. <laughs> member from Dover. Madam Speaker, tomorrow is Thursday and Rural Caucus will be meeting at 8 a.m. in room 270, uh, hearing from public assets on tax filing information, uh, more about Tourism Day, and we will be hearing from sponsors and advocates on S213. Member from Hartford. I'm excited to announce that the third convening of the Public Health Caucus will take place this Friday, April 5th, from 12 to 1 in room 267 of the pavilion. There will be a homemade light lunch offered, and we will discuss the impact of education on public health. Our special guest is the superintendent of the Winooski School District, Wilmer Chavaria. Chavaria is a refugee born in a defense camp during the Sandinista Contra War in Nicaragua, and later went on to complete a Master's of Education Policy and Management from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, where he now coaches master's degree candidates. We look forward to hearing his perspective and having a thoughtful discussion. All are welcome, I hope you'll join. Are there any further announcements? Seeing none, member from Pulteney, can you please offer us a motion to adjourn until Thursday, April 4th at 1 p.m. Madam Speaker, I make a motion this body stand in adjournment until Thursday, April 4th, 2024 at 1 p.m. You have heard the motion. Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And this body stands in adjournment until tomorrow at 1 p.m.